Thank you, Brother Neville. The Lord bless you real richly. And good evening, friends. It's a grand privilege to be back here in this building again tonight and feeling the never-failing presence of our Lord as he's given the promise. And now I know that many of you have stayed over for the little message tonight, which I am very thankful. Many of you have to drive far yet tonight to get home. Some are checked out of your motels, as I understand. And we are going to try not to hold you long, so that's the reason we come in early, so we could get away early. And now we will just, as soon as I can, I will announce when we are going to maybe start. Uh, I've had some calls this afternoon knowing when we was going to start on these books or this uh, chapters, and I think if the Lord willing... I want to take the next time that we start on the seven seals of Revelations and the seven natural seals, and then if we get to in time, take the seven seals on the back of the book. See, now that may take a little time. Uh, see, there's seven seals. It's open. There's seven plagues, seven trumpets, all those sevens. And them seals we could take first. But then on the back of the book is sealed with seven seals. Daniel heard the voices, the thunders, and was forbidden to write it. John was forbidden to write it. But it was sealed on the back side of the book. That is, after all of the mysteries of the book has been given out and revealed, you know, as Daniel said there, the mysteries in the days of these voices, the mystery of God should be unfolded by that time. Amen. See? The mystery, who God is, how he was made flesh, all these things should be unfolded by that time. And then, then we're ready for the seven seals on the back side of the book that's not even revealed to man, not even wrote in the Bible. But they'll have to be just exactly compared with the rest of the Bible, and I think it'll be a great thing. <laughs> so now um, uh, we're going to try to hurry to get through. Thank every one of you for your kindness and your presence and, and all that you have done, we thank you very much. And now I, I'm trusting that we won't keep you too long tonight because you're so patient to sit, stand. My wife said back there, she's talking about last night, she said, I seen women that were even rather heavy set standing there in their clothes wringing wet, standing there just grasping every word. That's the reason I like to stay under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, Amen. that when you come out, you're telling them people the honest truth. See? There's just nothing but the truth. And then they can lay on to that, and it'll be all right. Now, I want to ask your apology for a few moments. I left a little early this morning, and the tapes are turned off at this time, and I, I'm... Just in a moment, I'll tell the recorders when to turn the tape on. I want to finish the countdown, five minutes uh, uh, for it, uh, before I leave. I forgot and went away. I was just so carried away this morning because I just went out without saying anything about it. But I kind of left you, what was the countdown? See, I know we're in the countdown, but what is the countdown? See, if you don't know what the countdown is, then you'd be kind of confused. And so I, I'd like to, to bring that off just and try to be in the same tone that I was to finish up this tape at now to, so the tape goes out. Countdown. Now, uh, you all will forgive me just for a moment, and I want to finish up that tape. Will you do it for just a moment? Amen. Then we'll start on the other. And now, now the tape recorders, if you will... Snap on your tape now. Coming in from different places, and we've had a great time in the last three messages uh, uh, speaking on the subject of, of different doctrines and so forth that we have put forth. I just remember at this time I'm to give a little space in there, you people on the tape, for the change over your tapes. Now, I'll tell you when we're ready to turn on. <laughs> um, now, I have to watch this. It seems like a bunch of made-up formal, but 
them boys has got to get the tape and they can't get it all messed up. If you do, people out there won't understand it. <laughs> so we have to take it in this manner. And if somebody will just step out of the room and signal me there, Junior, when they're ready to have the tapes uh, crossed over. Thank you very much, folks. I say again for all your kindness and everything. All right. We are ready now. You can turn them on. The Lord bless you. We're happy to be here in the tabernacle again tonight. The place packed out with many people standing around again tonight with three days of, or three times of service. I would that if anyone listens to this tape, that they would like to get back and get last night's tape. Study it in your home. It's the, the present stage of the ministry that the Lord has given me. Especially, I like for ministers to hear that before I visit their churches and come in their homes. Now, I'd like for them to, to get that. Now, this morning we spoke on the subject of the countdown. The church ready to leave. And now, tonight, God willing, we're speaking on the subject of in His presence. Oh, how we thank God for the privilege that we can come into His presence. Uh, first, I wish you all to turn in your Bibles with me to the prophet Isaiah, the sixth chapter of the prophet Isaiah. We all know that Isaiah was a major prophet and one of the great prophets of his day. He ended his life by being sawed asunder with saws for a testimony as a martyr to the power of Almighty God. In the book of Isaiah... The sixth chapter, I begin at the fifth verse to read. Then said I, Woe is me. Or maybe I start with the first verse. Let's pardon me a moment. Let's start at the first verse and read down to about the eighth verse. In the year the king Ezekiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne. High and lifted up in his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one having six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the thongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, send me. <laughs> May the Lord bless His word. I think that's the most striking uh, scripture. We find that in the presence of God, Man recognize themselves to be sinners. We may feel pretty good when we're out different places and feel like that we're pretty good people. But when we ever come into the presence of God, then we see how little we are. Amen. Standing not long ago with a, a friend of mine that I had the privilege of leading to Christ, Bert Call. Up in New Hampshire, a hunting partner, we are standing by Colebrook Falls up in the Adirondack. 
And it was such a mammoth big falls. I'd taken my family last year up there to look at it. Way back off the road, you have to hike back to get to it. And when we seen that blue-green water pouring with such mighty power out of the mountains and gushing down over the rocks, Bert stood there and looked at me and he said, Gee, Billy, it makes a man feel just so little. He measured about a quarter of an inch on his fingers. And I said, That's right, Bert. Now, that was all he knowed of getting into the presence of God to see his creation. I wonder the man who wrote, How Great Thou Art, if he didn't look up one night and look at the stars, how far they are away. A few months ago, Brother Fred, Brother Woods, and I were standing with Brother McAnilly out in the Arizona desert. We was measuring, trying one star, how close it was to the other. And with the millions and billions of miles away, they didn't look over a quarter of an inch from each other. Then we begin to think, according to scientific proof of that, those stars are probably further away from each other than we are from them. See how it is? Then we realize how little we are when we realize how great He is and how close we come in, uh, coming to His presence. Somehow or another, it's always stroke a great effect upon people to come into the presence of God. I've seen the time in my ministry when you would see the presence of God come into such a place that it would bring a person up and just reveal the life to them and call out their sins of all kinds of immoral acts. And it brings such a holy hush amongst the people till they drop out of the prayer line before they ever come up to be prayed for Amen. and run to the altar and get right with God before they come up into His presence. There's something about coming into the presence of God. It causes things to happen. I've seen people laying in cots and stretchers that night down there at Mexico when that little dead baby laying under a blanket that the little Spanish mother brought up, or little Mexican mother, rather, brought up, when they seen several thousands of those people saw maybe 50 or 75,000 at one gathering, saw that little dead baby come to life. Women fainted. People threw up their hands and screamed. Why? They realized that a human being could not do that. Amen. That they were in the presence of Almighty God. Amen. And it caused something to happen. Amen. I've been privileged to hear godly man speak. It was said one time of Charles Finney. Little bitty fella, never weighed over about 110 pounds. But he had such a forceful way of speaking. Until he was trying the acoustics one day in a building. They didn't have PA systems then. And there was a man repairing up in the balcony or up in the roof of the place. And he heard the man come in, so he didn't know who they were. He just kept quiet. Mr. Finney was going to try the acoustics after spending much time in prayer for that revival that he's going to hold. He tried his voice to see how it would carry. He slipped up quickly to the pulpit and said, Repent or perish! And he said it with such force. Forced after being under the donate of God till the man dropped out of the top of the balcony down onto the floor, out of the top of the building, onto the floor. He preached the gospel in such way till he stood in Boston, Massachusetts, in a little bay window because there's no church could hold his crowd. And he stood there with such mighty force and preached hell such a place until working men with their baskets under their arms fell into the street and screamed for mercy. Amen. In the presence of God. Amen. Great preachers who's been able by the word of God to bring the presence of God to an audience. Far be it that man would ever be so seared in their hearts so they could never recognize the presence of God. Far be it. When the first man, as soon as he had sinned and done something wrong, and when God came into his presence or he came into the presence of God... Adam, he could not stand in the presence of God. Amen. 
He ran and hid himself in the bush and tried to cover himself with a fig leaf because he knew he was standing in the presence of Jehovah the Creator. That was the reaction of the first man after he had sinned and tried to come into the presence of God with sin upon his soul. He could not hide because he was tender yet. Sin had not took a hold like it has rooted into people's hearts today. But he was very conscious that he was standing before his Creator. Now, he hid himself in the bushes and would not come out and could not come out until God had made a preparation for him. We could go back and take a Genesis, the 17th chapter and the third verse. When the great patriarch Abraham, when he came into the presence of God, and God spoke to him in the 17th chapter, in the name of Almighty God, Abraham fell on his face. The great patriarch, servant of God, could not stand in the presence of God, though he had served him for 25 years faithfully. But when God moved into his presence, the patriarch fell on his face because he couldn't stand in the presence of God. In Exodus 3, we find that Moses, the great servant and prophet of God, when he was back on the backside of the desert, that man was a holy man. He had been born for the purpose. He was born from his mother's wombs to be a prophet. He had tried to get his education and do everything he could to deliver his people because he understood that he was to deliver his people. But when he had understood it by a theological standpoint, he was trained, he was well scholared. He could teach the Egyptians wisdom, which was the most smartest people in the world. He knew all the ins and outs. He knew the scripture from A to Z. He knew the promises that God had made. He knew them from an intellectual standpoint. And he was a, a great military man. But one day, on the back side of the desert, when he came into the presence of God, he jerked off his shoes and fell to his feet, knowing that he was on holy ground. He could not stand upon his feet when he come in the presence of God. He fell to his face like Abraham did. He could not stand in the presence of God. In Exodus 19, 19, when the chosen people of God, since the way back in the days of Abraham, from Abraham come Isaac, Isaac come Jacob, by Jacob come the patriarchs, and years after years they developed holy man. Great man, a chosen people, a chosen race, a sanctified, holy people, and had served God their life. And one day God said, gather Israel out here, I'm going to speak to them. But when God came down on top of Mount Sinai, Amen. and the whole mountain caught a fire, and the smoke was flying from it like a furnace, and the voice of God roared out, Israel fell on their faces and said, Let Moses speak and not God, lest we die. Amen. Man, in the presence of God, realizes he's a sinner, yet they were everyone circumcised according to the law. They had carried the commandments and everything. But when God spoke and they moved up into his presence, they realized that they were out. They were, they were not right. There was something that was lacking. Because they were in the presence of God. Yes. And they said, let Moses speak and not God. For if God speaks, we'll all die. Let Moses speak to us. It was in Luke 5, 8, that when Peter, oh, when he was a great stubborn man, and a man of great influence, great power that we understand, he was like a bully. A noted fisherman. But when he saw the miracle of God performed by an ordinary man look like, which he recognized at that time that that taken more than a man to throw all that fish in a net where he with all of his education, his knowledge of fishing, had fished all night and not even taken a thing. But he heard someone say, cast your net in. Yeah. And when he began to pull, he had a great multitude of fishes. And he realized that he was a sinful man. And he said, Depart from me, O Lord, for I am a Amen. sinful man. Amen. Who Amen. said that? St. Peter. 
And the presence of God asked for God to depart out of His presence because He recognized Himself a sinner. Abraham recognized himself wrong. Adam recognized himself wrong, which was the Son of God, recognized himself wrong. Moses recognized himself wrong. Israel as a church and nation recognized themselves wrong. Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. He didn't try to say, now I'm holy and worthy to receive this. He said, I am a sinful man. One time a self-styled religionist with all the theology they could learn under a great teacher called Gamaliel. His name was Saul of Tarsus, which we know as Paul. Religious to the dot. He knew all the ins and outs of their religion. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisee and a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a noted man, a scholar, smart, shrewd, educated, claiming to know God from baby up. One day on his road down to Damascus, that pillar of fire shined over him and he fell on his, off of his feet to the ground in the dust and said, Lord, what would you have me to do? Amen. All of his great training, all of his great theological training, all of his education didn't mean a thing when he stood in the presence of God. Amen. I'd like to stop here a minute and say that's the same thing. You might have DD, PhD, whatever you might be. You might have went to church since you was a child. You might have done all the religious acts there is, but once in the presence of God, Amen. you feel so little in no count. Paul realized that he was wrong, and he fell to the ground under the influence and power when he looked up and seen the very God that he'd been preaching and against the thought he knowed and seen that he was wrong. He fell from his feet to the ground. Because he was in the presence of God, he seen that pillar of fire. What about the great St. John of Revelations 1-7? When he was showed the vision and looked and heard a voice speaking to him, and he turned to look to see the voice, and he saw seven golden candlesticks. And one stood in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks with hair like wool, eyes like flames of fire, feet like pillars of brass, he was girded with a golden girdle around the paps, and he was called the Word of God. And when the great Saint John had walked with Christ, leaned up on his bosom, when he done all these things, as I said this morning, Paul's ministry exceeded any of them. Here after John had walked with Jesus, talked with him, slept with him, eat with him, but when he seen him standing there, that glorified state, he said he fell like a dead man at his feet. Think of it. We can come to church and talk and praise God and so forth, but oh, brother, when we see him coming, something will be different in our hearts. We might think we do our religious duty, but go to church and pay our tithings. We might think that we keep the laws of the church and recite all the creeds, but once let us get a look at Him, the whole thing's changed all the way around. Yes, it's sure. This great man, St. John, a great man like that, the Bible said in Revelations 1-7 that he fell as if he was a dead man. After a, three and a half years of fellowship with Christ, was one of the writers of the epistles, wrote behind him, eat with him at the table, slept with him at the bed, and fellowship with him wherever he went. But when he's turned to see him, he had no more life left in him. He fell like a dead man to the floor or to the ground. All right. We see Isaiah. In Isaiah 6 and 5, as we've just read, this great mighty prophet He's one of the greatest prophets there is in the Bible. There are 66 books of the Bible. There are 66 chapters in Isaiah. Isaiah starts off in Genesis. The middle of Isaiah he brings in the New Testament. At the end of Isaiah he brings in the millennium. Just exactly Genesis, the New Testament, and Revelation. Perfect. Isaiah was one of the major prophets. But one day he had been leaning upon the arm of Ezekiah. 
the great king, Hezekiah had been taken from him. And he was down. He was a pretty good fellow. He was a good, righteous man. If that righteous king, a good king, recognized him as a holy man and kept him in his temple, Isaiah saw visions. He was a prophet. Isaiah preached the word. He was a minister. Isaiah was a holy man. But one day, down in the temple, he fell into a trance and he saw the glory of God. He saw the angels with wings over their face, wings over their feet, flying with wings, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That prophet realized he was nothing. He said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, a prophet, a mightiest prophet of the Bible, one of them. I am a man with unclean lips, and I dwell among people that's unclean lips. Woe is me, because I see the glory of God. And he said, when that angel cried, the post of the temple shook back and forth. Oh, yeah. Brother, that will make you, not only is the post of the temple going to shake, but the whole heavens and earth's going to shake. Yeah. Yeah. The mountains will flee and the sea will fade away and scream, hide us from the face of him that sits upon the throne. Yeah. It's going to be a terrible time, I tell you. Sinner friend, you better be checking it up. That's right. Now, Isaiah said, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell among unclean people. And I'm these people as unclean lips. Now remember, if such holy men recognize themselves sinners in the presence of God, what will the sinner and ungodly do at that day? What will people do who sit in the meetings? What will the people do that's seen the power of God, that's heard the countdown on the Word, that's seen God manifest Himself, and beyond a shadow of doubt, ever Scripture fulfilled, and will still try to make it to heaven without being born again and receive the Holy Ghost? The Bible said, if a righteous man be scarcely saved, where will the sinner and ungodly appear? What kind of a place are we going to stand in? If we see God unfold Himself right before us and see the glory of God just the same as that man did. And that kind of man cried out, prophets and sages upon whom the word is based upon. If they cried and fell to their feet and screamed on man of unholy lips. Uncleanness. What will it be then for that man who won't even confess his sins? What will it be for that teenager that won't confess his or her sins? What will it be for that hard-hearted man that thinks he knows more about uh, God's creation than God does himself? What will happen to that man who spent all of his life trying to disprove the Bible? Where will that guy appear at? Think of it. This is evangelism. This is a time to shake people. This is a time that God said there come a time He shook Mount Sinai one time, but there come a shaking again that He wouldn't only shake Mount Sinai, but He'd shake everything that could be moved. But did you notice the rest of Scripture? But we receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. Hallelujah. Everything that can be shook will be shaken. The heavens will shake. The earth will shake. Heavens and earth will pass away. But that word shall never pass away. For on this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will never break. Everything that can be shook will be shaken. But we receive a kingdom which is a word of God Himself and God is His word. He don't shake Himself. <laughs> Amen. Oh my but we receive a kingdom that cannot be moved. It's unshakable, said Paul, the Hebrew writer. Such a person and such a man, such a time, and how they felt. We have also ourselves, we've seen the glory of God like this man did. Sir, we've seen it. We've seen the glory of God like Abraham saw it. We saw the glory of God like Moses saw it. Same pillar of fire. The same power of God, the same Christ unrevealing Himself, 
showing himself, keeping his word in the last day. How can we come by them and walk and treat it so lightly? How can we walk around and hold our creeds and denominations and not take the word of God? Amen. What will it be for us in that day? How will it happen with us? When we see the glory of God, some people will stand off and make fun of it. Some will laugh at it. Some will call it fanaticism. Some call it mental telepathy. Some call it Beelzebub. Yeah, so. Some call it one thing or another. Wow. As the old Proverbs is, fools will walk with hobnailed shoes where angels fear to trod. Yeah. Right? The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. When he sees God manifested so perfectly by his own word, not by a creed, but by his word, and then walk right over it and make fun of it, he's a fool. Yeah. Oh, since God is the word and God's made himself plain to him. And he's a fool, the Bible says. What will it be for him when he has to stand in that place? It'll be, a, it'll be terrible for that man in that day, the ungodly. Repented sinners, though, doesn't have any fear. Oh, no. A sinner that will repent, he knows that there's a bloody sacrifice waiting to stand in his way. That's what gives me the consolation. I've seen the glory of God. I've felt his power. I know the touch of his hand. I know the touch of his chastisement. I know that he's God. And I know I'm undone. But there's one standing there for me. Amen. There's one who stands there and says, Father, lay all of his iniquity upon me because he stood for me down on the earth. Hallelujah. Then I walk to the throne of God boldly, having grace in my heart. But no, it's not by good works, but by his mercy I'm saved. Not what I can do, what I can join, what I can say, but it's by his grace that he saved me. No wonder the poet that caught that scream out, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Once was lost, but now I'm found blind, but now I see. How can I ever go to heaven? How could you go to heaven? We cannot do it. We need no way for us to do it. But there's one made the way. And he is the way. And how do we get to him? By one spirit, his spirit. We're baptized into one body, which will be raised up like an orbit. We'll go out of the earth as astronauts of this last day. The faith of God. Amen. Amen. Sure. Repented sinners don't have to worry. Someone is there in their place. Oh, then after we have come into his presence now, and we are know we've been in his presence, we've seen him do things that he did when he was here on earth. How do you know the how do you know the vine you're looking at? Because the fruit it bears. Yes, amen. How do you know the church you're going to? By the fruit it bears. Amen. Jesus said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. Amen. These signs shall follow them that believe. Amen. Uh, we see he never did ordain us to go make denominations. He never did ordain us to go make creeds. But he warned us against such. Amen. For whosoever shall take anything from it or add anything to it, the same will be taken out of their part in the book of life. Amen. See? So we're not ordained to do nothing but stay with that word. Amen. And if a man is sent of God, he'll stay with the word because God can only send by his word. Amen. He must stay Amen. by his word. Then when we come into his presence, when a man once comes into the presence of God, he's changed forever. Amen. If there's any change in doing. Amen. Now, there are those who could walk in the presence of God and pay no attention to it. He wasn't ordained to life. But if he was predestinated of God, as soon as that first move hits, he knows it. Amen. That catches fire. Look at that little prostitute down there that day. At Samaria, that woman. She's in a bad shape mentally and physically. We know that. But as soon as she's seen that sign done of the Messiah, she said, We well, you know Messiah's coming to do this. Thou must be his prophet. He said, I'm that Messiah that was wrote to come. She recognized it. She never asked one more question. She started right quick with the responsibility to know that if she had found that and come into the presence of God, she was responsible to tell somebody else about it. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Right. Any man that comes into the presence of God is responsible Amen. before God from that minute on yes. to tell somebody else. Yes. Amen. 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 
Look at Abraham. Look at Moses. Look at Peter. Look at Paul. The moment they come into the presence of God, recognize themselves sinners and seal their testimony with their life. Look at the little lady. She couldn't stay no longer. She went to the city and told the man, come see the man who told me the things I've done. Isn't this Messiah? They could not deny it because it was scriptural. Certainly, they said, got to do it. A man, when we got a responsibility of telling others, as Moses did, as Peter did, as Paul did, after these things you've seen it and come into his presence, you're responsible for the message to get to somebody else. Yes, yes, yes. You just cannot sit still with it. You must take it to someone else. Amen. I remember an old sister used to be here, Brother Grim Snelling's mother. She used to sit right here in the church and she would sing, I've just got over, I'm running, 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 I've just got over and I can't sit down. <laughs> she had just found something. I went over to a little colored church over here and Lowell and uh, all of them were standing up singing, I'm running up the King's Highway. Just found it and took up the highway. There's something about it. When you find Christ, you cannot hold your peace any longer. The rest of your days, you are a changed person. Amen. For when life and life comes together, it makes a bright light. <laughs> True. When the bulb connects with the wires, if it's a correct bulb, it's got to give light. When the current and the bulb gets together, there's nothing to do but scatter light. It has to do it. And when a man or a woman is predestinated to eternal life and they see the current of God catch that bulb, it'll throw light everywhere it can. It might not be over a 10 watt, but you'll scatter what lights you got. Being a 500 watt, scatter 10 watt light. <laughs> Give your light. Let your light so shine before man that they might see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. Yes, sir. When a man comes in contact with God, he recognizes himself no good. How can a man walk around and brag about how big he is and what all he's done when he's nothing? He's nothing to begin with. One day down in Memphis, Tennessee, or one, I don't think it's in Memphis, it's one of the places there. I was with Brother Davis since having a, a revival. It might have been Memphis. And we was, went to a coliseum. And they had a, in there, the, not a coliseum, it's kind of an art gallery. And they had the, uh, the great statues that they'd got from different parts of the earth of different Hercules and so forth and great artists that painted. And then they had the analysis of a man that weighed 150 pounds. You know how much he's worth? 84 cents. That's all he is. 84 cents is all, he, all the chemicals you can get out of him. He's just got enough whitewash to sprinkle a hen's nest, and he's got enough, um, uh, just a little bit of calcium, a little potash. It would all sell for 84 cents. But we just take care of that 84 cents and baby it around. There's two boys standing there, and one looked at him and said, Jim, we're not worth very much, are we? He said, no, we're not, John. I said, well, wait a minute, boys. you got a soul in there that's worth 10,000 worlds. That's been, could be redeemed by the power of God if you just let it. Man, when he sees these things, he's responsible to tell others. I saw it when I was just a boy. I spent my whole life at it. I only saw I got one life. Wish I had 10,000. If I had an eternity, I'd still want to tell people about it. Because it's the greatest thing I ever found. If you'll read in Ezekiel 33... 33rd chapter of Ezekiel, there was a watchman set on a tower. And this watchman was responsible for the entire city. Hey, man. Now, wake, wake yourselves to your spiritual conscience a minute while I get to this scripture. That watchman had to be a trained man. He had to know what he was doing. For at any distance, as soon as it arose, the enemy, he could detect it. Amen. He could tell their march. Amen. He could tell their color. Amen. He could tell their rank and file. Amen. Just as far as the human eyes could see, he could see it. And he was higher than the rest of them. Amen. For he was trained to know the enemy. Amen. And God required the whole city at his hand. Amen. Watchman, what of the night. <clears throat> Hallelujah. That's the way God's soldiers are today. Amen. They're trained to the Word. Amen. When anything comes up, it's got a little polish to it that's got something else that's not Scripture, they warn their congregation. Amen. Anything that's not Bible, anything that's not, that's not God-like, 
such as having soup suppers, dances, and everything else to pay off the pastors. Amen. Those things are wrong. Amen. Bunk hole games and card parties Amen. in the churches, that's wrong. Amen. And the real watchman on the wall who's once been in the presence of God, Amen. if he isn't on the wall, if he just supposed to be on the wall, the wall may not be any higher than the rest of the congregation. Yeah. But if he's a correct watchman, God raises him put up in the spheres yeah. that the rest of them never gets to. Yeah. But he watches the flock. Yeah. And God requires it of him. Yeah. The man of God who stands in the presence of God and knows God is God and knows that God keeps his word and watch God perform himself and do his duty and keep his word. That no matter how many organizations that are not yeah, nation tries to tear it down, he knows the rank and file of the enemy. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He knows what to tell the congregation, yes. a real watchman. Yes. If we have confessed that he is that we've been in his presence, and we have confessed our sins, they are blotted out. The book of his memory. Now, there's nobody but God could do that. Amen. Now, you can do anything to me, I'll forgive you, but I'll remember it. If I do anything to you, you forgive me, but you'll remember it. But God can forgive and forget it. Amen. Think of that. Don't even remember it. Amen. That makes me feel good. When it's not even remembered anymore. Nothing can do it but God. <laughs> Nothing but God can do that. He said he would blot it out of his book of memory. I can't do it. You can't do it. Because we've only got these little finite senses. But he's infinite God. He can absolutely forget that it ever was done. A young lady come from a country church and her father was an old-fashioned shouting preacher or member of the church. And so she moved into the city and she got all mixed up with the women down there, got to acting like they did in the fashions. And one day she was kind of ashamed for her papa and mama to come or her father rather, her mother was dead. So the old man... Only thing he'd do, get up of the morning, eat his breakfast, and get the Bible, and read it, and cry, and pray, and shout all day long, and up and down the room. And she was a little embarrassed about it. So then, then when it, all time through the night, if he got a hold of the Bible and started reading it, he'd raise up out of the bed and heart, glory to God, hallelujah, oh, glory to God, just stomping, cry half the night. So one day, she's going to entertain her church members. To a little tea party like they always have, you know. So she didn't know what she's going to do with her dad. After all, it was her daddy. So she decided she'd put him up in an attic and say, Daddy, you don't want to be around where these women are, do you? Said, no, I don't even want to do that. He said, Well, we're going to have the church women up here today, and we're going to have a little meeting, a little prayer meeting. So I, I tell you, Dad, why don't you just go up in the attic? I said, I just believe I'll do that. So she said, read this nice book. And she gave him a geography. Took his Bible away from him so he'd keep quiet. So in order to read the Bible, well, he would go to making a lot of noise up there. So he's right up over him. You know where he's having their party. So she gave him the geography. He said, this is nice. You should read it, Daddy, because it tells you all the truth about the world. Or he said, I'll be glad to read that. So he said, now you go up there and keep real quiet. So these women leave, and then I'll, you can come back down, and then you can do whatever you want to. He agreed to do it. So he goes upstairs, sets up there, and they're all having their tea party, you know, talking about so-and-so, and you know how it goes. Having all that big time. About that time, something cut loose upstairs. All the screaming and jumping and the plaster falling. The old man running up and down to the attic just as hard as he could go, jumping up and down. Our glory to God, glory to God. The women didn't know what happened up there, what they had upstairs. So directly down the steps he come. Hard as he could go. She said, Daddy, I'll give you a geography to read. He said, Yes, I know it. You know, he said, I was reading in this geography here where there's places in the sea that ain't got no bottom in it. 
and said, I read over here in the Bible yesterday, he said, he put my sins in the sea of forgiveness. Glory to God. Glory to God. Said they're still going, they don't have an end, they just keep on going. That's right. And he was shouting about it. Well, that's right. God puts our sins in the sea of forgetfulness. Amen. Locks them out, and they're as if they never did happen. Amen. Oh, my. Then we stand by the grace of God through Jesus Christ our Lord pure and holy, just as holy as He was. Amen. Because He doesn't see me when I come up there. He sees His own Son. (laughs) The only way He can't see me because I'm in His Son. (laughs) And He only sees His Son. Isn't that wonderful? We don't have to think about sins anymore. It's all gone. It's under the blood. Yes, sir. Don't have to worry about it anymore. It's all out of the and out of God's memory. You don't even remember it no more. Isaiah, that mighty prophet, when he confessed his sins, he said, Woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. A prophet. I'm a man of unclean lips. And my congregation's unclean. The people I preach to, they're unclean. I'm unclean. And woe is me, but here comes a bunch of angels down from the glory of God, fanning back the, the clouds, and I look up there and see his train filling the whole heaven. Yeah. And I watch these angels that's never known what sin was. They never even know what sin was. Yeah. And there, in the presence of God, they got two wings over their faces. They got two wings over their feet. And they're flying with two wings, and they cry day and night, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. <laughs> That'd make you feel kind of unholy, wouldn't it? <laughs> Now, what did he do? He said, Woe is me. And when he confessed his sins and said, Woe is me, the angel went over and tucked the tongs, picked up a coal of fire, which represented the Holy Ghost and fire, and come over and laid it on the prophet's lips and said, I've cleansed you. <laughs> Then the wings were winning their way like that, moved away the curtains of time, and he heard God say, Who will go for us? <laughs> But after he found out that there was a way to rid sin, God wanted somebody to go for him, and he said, Here am I, send me. Amen. He had been in the presence of God and had confessed his sins and been cleansed from his sins and was ready for service. Amen. 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 As the poet caught that said, millions now in sin and shame are dying. Listen to their sad and bitter cry. Hasten, brother, hasten to the rescue. Quickly answer, Master, here am I. And I think of Africa, India, and around the world. Millions of heathens screaming and crying for mercy. And who will go? Not pass them a track, but bring them Jesus Christ. Somebody in his presence, like Moses who could go down there and show them true deliverance, not make them join a church or shake Amen. hands and have a creed, Amen. but bring deliverance to their soul. Amen. Some good godly man. Yes, Isaiah confessed his sins and was cleansed. After Jacob had wrestled all night in confessing his sins, you know the place he was? It's called Pentel. P-E-N-I-T-E-L. Pentel. The word Pentel in the Hebrew means the face of Of Almighty God. Jacob, the little shyster, had run all, his name was Jacob, which means supplanter, that's deceiver, had run all of his life away from God. But when he got one time in the presence of God at Pentel, in the face of God, he got a hold of God and wouldn't turn him loose. God, we need more Jacobs. <laughs> he held on to the face of God. In the presence of God, he stayed until it was sun up. God said, let me go, because the sun's arising. And he stayed in the face of God until sun up, but he went away justified and saved. Oh, <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. oh, what a great thing it was. Now, to know that he had wrestled through. That's, he had seen signs of God. He had had dreams about God. 
But this is one time he was in the face of God, in the presence of God. Think of it, friends. Now, as we hurry up, in the presence of God, a man's changed. Jacob was changed. Now he could walk with God. Yes, he was a different man than what he was when he went up there. The battle was now over. Yes, sir. And he began to build an altar. He hadn't been used to building altars, you know. But I'll tell you, when you come in the presence of God, you want to build an altar somewhere. You want to find somewhere where you can pray. He built an altar. He was cleansed. And God had won. And Jacob was changed from Jacob's supplanter to Israel, a prince having power with God. That's what happened to Jacob. The supplanter, the deceiver, the unrighteous, the unholy, the deceiver, deceived his brother, stole the birthrights as it was from his brother, took a little dirty way of doing it. Such a deceiver. He deceived his father-in-law. Put pauper sticks and made speckled calves. When the cow has been pregnant, he'd come there, look at the sheep, would see that speckled stick and make speckled cattle. Give them birthmarks. Deceiver, deceiving his own father-in-law. Deceived his mother. Deceived his daddy. Deceived his brother. But when he once got in the... He was a shyster. He was running everywhere he went. Always on the run from God. He's on the run from his brother. But when he come into the presence of God, he recognized he was a sinner. Amen. What did he do? What did he do? He seen his opportunity. He had met something that he didn't even think about before. And he stayed there until all sins was gone. Oh, my. God got him in his own presence. God manages a way to get man in their presence and to make their decision. Some of them run from him. Some run to him. If they're predestinated to life, they believe it. They hang on to it. If they're not, they try to get away and say there's nothing to it. See? And that's the guy that's lost. The guy that confesses his sin shall have pardon. If you hide your sin, you'll not prosper. No. So Jacob, when he, it was the next day, he met Esau, his brother. He didn't need no help from him there. He didn't need his armies. He is business building altars. Amen. <laughs> He wasn't afraid of Esau no more. Psalms 16, 8. David said, I have set the Lord before me. That's a good thing to do. Yeah. Psalms 16, 8. I have set the Lord before me. So he could not be confused about it. Uh, he wanted to be conscious of his presence. So David said, I have set the Lord always before my face. Now, I... David, have set the Lord before my face, always to be conscious, conscious of God's presence. Wouldn't that be a good lesson for all of us tonight? Amen. Set the Lord before a face so we'll be conscious of His presence. Put Him first. Why? Put Him first before you. Why? Then you won't sin when you are realizing that constantly you're in the presence of God. When you realize God's around, you watch what you say. A man, when he thinks God's gone, he'll cuss. He'll lust after women. He'll, do, he'll steal, cheat, lie. He'll do anything when he thinks that God don't see him. But bring him into the presence of God, he'll stop it right now. Oh, yeah. And David said, I have put the Lord always before me. That's a good thing. No Amen. wonder God said he's man after his own heart. Amen. Man will do everything when he thinks that God is near. But when he realizes that God is near, do you ever know it's a sinner? Let a godly person walk up, he'll quit his cussing. Yeah. If he's got any respects at all. Yeah. He won't tell the dirty jokes that he would have told. See, he, he'll leave off that because he knows that he's in the presence of God because God dwells in the tabernacle of his people. See, Amen. After David did this, he said... My heart shall rejoice. I wish you read Psalm 16. My heart will rejoice and my flesh shall rest in hope. Why? My heart shall rejoice because I've got God before me all the time. Yes. And my flesh shall rest in hope. If I die, I'll be raised up again. Amen. Or he'll not suffer his Holy One to see corruption. Amen. Neither will he leave his soul in hell. Amen. See, when David put God before him, 
and was conscious that constantly he was in the presence of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Now listen, church. I love you. Now I want you to listen to me now. If Brother McCullough, you say I'm going to say something. Always put the Lord before you. And don't you do nothing that you wouldn't do in His presence. Because He's watching over you. See, the Lord isn't camped about those who fear Him. He, don't, he just stays right near you. And He knows everything you're doing and you must recognize that. When you start to tell a lie, don't do it. Remember, God's listening at you. If you start to do a little cheat, don't you do it. God's looking at you. If you start to take His name in vain, don't do it. God's listening at you. Start smoking a cigarette, He's watching you. Yeah. His, we used to sing a song, All along on the road to the soul's true abode, there's an eye watching you. Yeah. Every step that you take, this great eye is awake, there's an eye yeah, watching you. Eye. Remember, do like David. Put the Lord always before your face. Then your heart will rejoice, and your flesh shall rest in hope. Praise For he promised it. Yes, sir. He knew that he had raised up because God had promised it. All right. When we come into his presence, we're changed, never to be the same. Look all down through the ages of every walk of life of man. Look at Abraham. You say, well, the changed life is just for ministers. Oh, no. The changed life is for everybody. Amen. Now, Abraham was a farmer. But when he heard God's voice speaking to him and saw that vision, he was a changed man from that time on. He separated himself from his kindred, from all his associates, and walked as a pilgrim and a stranger in a strange land the rest of his life. Hallelujah. Dwelling in tents because he clearly confessed that he was seeking a city whose builder and maker was God. Yeah. He knew there was a God and there was a city somewhere whose builder and maker was God. That's what Hebrews 11 tells us. That he's seeking a city as builder and maker was God. He was a changed man, yet he was nothing but a mere farmer. But he saw a vision and come into the presence of God and he was a changed man from then on. Moses, he was a shepherd, but he was a changed man when he come into the presence of God. He was a coward. He was running from Pharaoh with a whole army behind him. But with a stick in his hand, he went back and took the whole nation. Amen. Why? He come into the presence of God. He was a changed man, a shepherd. Peter, a fisherman, Know nothing about fishing or know nothing about God. Only thing he probably know was how to catch fish. But when he come in the presence of God and see the great creator who could create fish, when he told him, let down the net for the draw, there wasn't any fish there. He just pulled his nets up. But he said, as thy word, Lord, I believe that you're the son of God. And if, you let, if I let down the net, you told me to do it at your word because you and your word are the same. I'll let down the net. And when he began to pull... He said, depart, Lord, I'm a sinful man. A fisherman. After Peter met Christ, he was never the same anymore. He afterwards was so true to God, he was given the keys to the kingdom. Yes, sir. Paul, a self-styled Pharisee, educated and trained in all the religion of the, that there was in the world in that day, one of the highest known scholars in the land. But when he came before that pillar of fire one day, the God that he had persecuted ignorantly. He was a Pharisee. He didn't believe that God was a man. He knew God was a pillar of fire. It led his people out of Egypt. He had been with them all along. But when he saw this pillar of fire, he fell on his face. And he heard a voice saying, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. Hallelujah. He was a man. <laughs> he said, How have you been baptized? <laughs> Oh, glory. <laughs> he had been in the presence of God. <laughs> he was a changed man from then on. <laughs> he had been in the presence of God. It changes a man. Amen. Charles G. Finney, a lawyer, a great uh, Philadelphia lawyer. But when he come into the presence of God, he dropped his law Amen. study and become a mightiest preacher of this nation's oh, ever had glory. yet. He was a preacher because one day he come in the presence of God. He thought once he'd study the ministry. You know his book? I got his autobiography. He went out to pray. He thought he was a preacher. He had a desire that he wanted to preach. And he had him a few sermons to try to preach. He went out one day out of his office to pray. 
went out in the woods. He got down behind an old blowing down tree where he'd go every afternoon. Very religious. But he didn't believe in that. There's two women in the church kept saying, Mr. Finney, we're praying that you receive the Holy Ghost. He said, I got the Holy Ghost. He said, I'm a preacher. He said, Mr. Finney, you're a great man and you've got a great hold of the Word, but you need the Holy Ghost. We're praying for you. <laughs> Sweet little women. So he went on, on. So every day, he'd go out behind his office, his boss and all of them there, he'd work, and he'd go out of his law office and go out there to pray. And one day he was out there praying, and he heard a brush break. He thought his boss was coming up, hunting him. He jumped up real quick and said, Lord God, I believe he had something. Brush broke, he got, <clears throat> raised up and looked around. See where it was, broke the brush. And it was then he came in the presence of God. Uh, he realized that brush had broke for a purpose. He stood there, the tears running down his cheeks. He said, maybe that women's right. I'm ashamed for somebody to see me talking to my God. But I think it was an honor for somebody to see me talking to my boss. How much greater is my Lord than my boss? He said, Lord, forgive me and fill me with the Holy Ghost. Uh, Started screaming and shouting he's in the presence of God. He run downtown real quick to his office. He got to screaming so hard he had to go behind the door and said, Lord, I'll bring disgrace upon him. Hide me back here until I get over this spell. <laughs> Why? He'd come in the presence of God. He was a changed man. The sermons that he used to preach, he preached them same sermons and souls came to the altar. See, he had been in the presence of God. Moody, a little old shoe cobbler, hardly knowed his ABCs. That's right. His grammar was poor. Somebody told him one day, your grammar's awful poor, Mr. Moody. He said, but I'm winning souls with it. <laughs> so, <laughs> one day in the newspapers, the editor went to uh, write in the newspaper. He went over to see how could this man hold crowds of people under any conditions. Little old guy, bald-headed and everything, and had whiskers hanging way down, kind of pot-bellied. He was a horrible-looking man to look at. So this newspaper really gave him a write-up. Said, I don't see what in the world that anyone would see in Dwight Moody. Said he's ugly, his voice is squeaky, <laughs> he's got whiskers plumbed down to his waistline, he's as bald-headed as a pumpkin, and said, how in the world would anybody ever go to see anything in Moody? So Moody's manager happened to see it and said, look, Mr. Moody, I'll read this to you. Moody couldn't read it himself. So I said, I'll read you the editorial. And he wrote it. Moody just shoved his shoulder and said, certainly not to come to see Christ. <laughs> was all. Why? He had been in the presence of God. From making souls on shoes for people to wear out, he shod the people with the gospel of preparation. Why? He was in the presence of God. Right. A little woman one time come in the presence of God, as guilty as she could be. And a moment when she realized that she was... In the presence of God, every sin was forgiven. And she was as pure and white as a lily. Oh, my. How many more I could call off here of people time wouldn't permit. But I want to talk a little bit about myself. <laughs> what could have been any lower in me? Where was I? Come out of a family of drunkards. Come out of a family of murderers. Come out of a family of bootleggers. And you know that. Every one of you know it. You know what kind of name we had here? People didn't speak to us on the street. I'd go downtown, start to talk to somebody. Nobody would talk to me unless somebody wasn't around to talk to me. Somebody else come up to leave me, and I'd stand there and cry. No, this ain't so. It can't be so. This is wrong. But one day, I come into the presence of God. Amen. He changed me, made me another kind of son. His grace brought me into His presence. I've never wanted to leave it. I've been in here now 30 some odd years. I don't want to leave it. I've got the assurance that I'll always be there. Even death itself will never separate me from His presence. No, I'll be with Him forever. When I seen His presence the first time, I cried like Isaiah, Woe is me. Then He touched me with His grace. I was a changed person. The little renegade that used to get out here and carry on and everything was changed. And since then, I've been his child. Since then, I've desired to give my whole life for his service. Only wish I had 10,000 more lives to give for him. 
This is getting pretty well wore out now. Fifty-three years has passed. About thirty-three of those has been, uh, thirty-two of those has been in the gospel. I wish I had another thousand uh, that I could spend. I, Why? Well, I once into his presence and realized that there was somebody who loved the unlovable. There was somebody who loved me when no one else did. There was somebody who cared for me when no one else cared. I put my arms around his cross. I embraced it to me and me and him become one man. And from then on, I've loved him. He stained my bosom and my heart with his blood by touching me and forgiving my sins. And I'm happy tonight to be one of his. I never desire to leave this heavenly place, though the tempter to persuade me off have tried. But I'm safe in God's pavilion, happy in His loving grace, and I'm living on the hallelujah side. My, it makes my heart rejoice. I'm recommending Him to every wearied person. I'm recommending Him to you that have no hope. You that's never been in His presence. The only thing you have to do is confess your sins and realize that you're wrong. And God has that angel ordained tonight called the Holy Ghost that will take all your sins away. Then you'll cry, Lord, here am I. Send me. Then you'll raise your hands and say, I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinners slain. Give Him glory, all ye people, for His blood has washed away each stain. I love Him, don't you? Living in His presence. I come to the pulpit here this morning feeling so bad and so sick. From uh, I was down in Kentucky last week with some personal friends of mine sitting here. If I stayed down there very long, they'd kill me. They sure would, with kindness. <laughs> some of the best cooks I ever know in my life. And when I get to my capacity, it's done overloaded. Brother Brandon, won't you have some of this? It's just so good, I just try to poke it down. <laughs> I got so full, I just couldn't even move. <laughs> I couldn't sleep. I'd get out and walk around a while. And... Uh, I wasn't feeling very good when I got in here this morning, but once when I come into His presence, uh, that settled it. That settled it. It all vanished away. Then. That's right. Oh, to live in His presence. I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinner. Let's bow our heads now. Mm-hmm. For he's done so much for me. He's forgiven my transgression, and his blood has washed my you're in here tonight and I know his presence this year standing in there a while ago to a little church of God girl the Holy Spirit moved in up on me when I was praying for that little child the parents had come down from the Anderson Church of God campground and the overseer over there knowing the child the doctor said he got to die right away with leukemia the little sweet little girl in her last stages now. She come back there and held her little hand out to me. It all swelled up with needles and things been in it blue. When I looked up on her, I saw a vision. The parents had just been reading a book out there, they know nothing about it. The general overseer at the camp up there told him said, Bring the child down here. 
They wanted to come back when we had a healing service, and I said, bring the child now. Felt led. When I stand right in there, the Holy Spirit went right back and brought out the history of the child. Uh, Told all about why it happened and what they'd done. Told the little girl's ambition was to be a piano player. And that mother just almost screamed out, and that daddy said, that's a God's truth. Uh, Sitting right there in the car now, listening to it. Couldn't get in. Sitting out there listening to it now. There come a big veil of a shadow hanging over the child. And I said, Satan, you are defeated. You're no respected person, God. And by the power of your resurrection and as your servant, I drive this devil from the child. A big bright light flashed over the top of her. It was over. Amen. Huh? Sure he's worthy of all praise. He knows all things. He knows your heart. And you know what you're thinking. He does too. If there's a little sin hanging on you tonight, you wouldn't want to go in the presence of God with that on you. Would you once more raise up your hand and say, Brother Brandon, pray for me. I want to be in His presence at that day, guiltless. God bless you. Many hands. God sees it in His presence. Now I'll tell you what you do. I just listen closely. Do like David did. Put the Lord before you right now. Put the Lord between you and that sin. Whatever that little besetting sin is, it might be lying, might be stealing, it might be evil thinking, it might be temper, might be drinking, might be smoking, might be gambling. I don't know what it is. might be lust. It might be anything. I don't know what it is. Whatever it is, put the Lord before you. And then your heart will rejoice and your flesh shall rest in hope. For you know that Christ promised He'd raise up again in the last days. When He comes forth, we'll come in His likeness. Won't you do it now while we pray? Our Heavenly Father, a little chopped up message by a tired, weary servant. But just thinking on the subject of dwelling in the presence of God. And we see tonight the effect that is taken upon holy man to come into your presence. What effect it had upon him? Sages, great, powerful prophets, ordained by God and sent to preach the word, and yet meet him face to face and fall to the ground like a dead man. What are we going to do at that day, Lord? We thought it over. We've been thinking it. Some 40 or 50 hands has been thinking it, Lord, for they just raised them hands or hearts beneath the hands has been thinking about meeting him since we've been speaking. What would they do if they had to meet him? My hands, Lord's up. What will I do? Now, Father, I've got many things that I do wrong. I've just confessed my sin this morning before the church as I confessed it to you on top of the mountain the other morning when it was blowing and snowing and up there on top of the mountain. How I cried out and asked you to forgive me for my stupidity and how I dreaded to come before my brethren, who some of them regard me as your prophet servant. And Lord, how I hated to come to before them and tell them of a stupid act that I would do a thing like that. But God, it's good for my soul that I confess my sins and not hide them. So to be honest with you and right before the people, I have confessed it, Lord. I'm wrong. I'm altogether wrong. I pray forgiveness. And then, Father, I've been dilatory about... Uh, you're serving him. Many times maybe I could have went longer when I didn't do it. Father, I confess my sins. I want the angel of God to cleanse me from that by the blood of Jesus. Other hands went up tonight. Some of them maybe has never asked forgiveness before. But I'm sure of this one thing. If we'll confess our sins, God will blot them out, put them in the sea of forgiveness and never remember them no more. And fathers, I confess mine about misbehaving before them people. I didn't carry on myself like a servant of Christ. I didn't, I was afraid that man might be angry with me and think I didn't want to hurt his feelings, but I didn't think of what I was doing to you, Lord. And I, I, I pray that you forgive me. And now, Father, I know that if I ask forgiveness, I have forgiveness. And you put him in a sea of forgiveness, and you'll never remember that no more. God, I'm thankful for that. And I pray that you'll let every person here that has sin, uh, besetting sin, of anything before them. May they remove it and put the Lord before them like David did. For now we cry, Woe is me, for I have seen the glory of God. I'm a man of unclean lips or a woman or girl of unclean lips. Boy or something, 
whatever we might be, we are unclean. And we ask for the blood of Jesus Christ, the appropriated sacrifice to cleanse us from all sin, that we might ever dwell in His presence. Let us go from here tonight with our hearts rejoicing and our flesh resting in hope, knowing this, that when Jesus does come, we'll be raised with Him in His likeness and shall meet Him in the air in the rapture. When the countdown is finally over, we see the seventh church age is already counted out, and we're ready now to take off. We pray, God, that you, before you close the door, if there be one here tonight has never come in, may they hurry in real quick, for we feel that the door of mercy between mercy and judgment is being closed. Those who will accept mercy will step in. Those who will not come in will have to suffer judgment. God closes the door. May there not be a door closed tonight to every one of these confessing sinners. May we all have pardon and mercy in Jesus Christ's name. And now, Father, for the sick and the afflicted, for those who are needy, I pray that your grace will supply all that they have need of. May they step into Christ, into his presence. Place Christ, be Christ, the promise. He was wounded for my transgressions. That's my sins. With his stripes, I am healed. Then I place the Lord before my sickness. He is on my right hand, and I shall not be moved. Then I walk boldly on, confessing that I am healed. By his stripes, I am healed. Grant it, Lord, to every one of them. And we know that if we confess with our hearts and or with our lips and believe in our hearts, then we have our desire. You said when you say anything, believe it comes to pass, you can have what you said. We believe that, Father, and believe that you'll cleanse us from all of our sins and heal all of our sickness and give us grace, Lord, to serve you. Be with these people. Many of them are going to travel the dark roads tonight. Many of them will travel many miles. Don't let nothing happen to them, Lord. They come across the country to sit here to listen to the countdown, to see how close we was to the end time. Now I've asked them to go away placing God before them, always before them, before anything else, before their trip, before their move, before, their, before they get up, after they go to bed, always before they sleep, wherever it is, put God first. For He is on my right hand, and I shall not be moved. And may their hearts rejoice to know that they have what they've asked for because God promised it, and their flesh shall rest in hope. Grant it, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 I will praise Him. I will praise Him. Praise the Lamb for sinners. Give Him glory, all ye people. For Do you believe you have placed the Lord between you and your sin? Between you and your sickness? Between you and your fault? Between you and your ways? The Lord is always before me, and I am in His presence. The next time I start to light a cigarette, the Lord is before me. The next time I start to lust, the Lord is before me. The next time I start to tell anything wrong, the Lord is before me. The next time I start to say a bad thing, the Lord is before me, and I shall not be moved. <laughs> Amen. I live in His presence each day with my dealing, each day with my talk. I walk as if the Lord is before me, because tonight I put Him before me. Amen. I shall not be moved. You love Him? Amen. Now, let us stand up now. Amen. Oh, I just feel real good. I just feel like I don't want to go home. And you know, it's only about 25 minutes till 9. I'm about two hours early. (laughs) Isn't that wonderful? Oh, my. But now, as we leave, let's remember, we must take the name of Jesus with us as a shield from every snare. And when temptations round us gather... Try us to keep us to remember that. Just breathe that holy name in prayer. Take 
The name of Jesus with you, child of sorrow and of woe, it with joy and comfort give you, oh, take it. Enjoys our pastor, Brother Neville. Amen. Aren't you thankful to the Lord for a good, honest, everyday man? Amen. Believes the gospel and he's doing such a wonderful job by obeying the commandments of God and preaching the word and keeping this great spiritual atmosphere in the church all the time. Amen. Remember, I've come down the East Coast, went across the South and up the West Coast and through Canada, and I haven't met one church that's as spiritual as this church right here. Amen. They've gone to see. Uh, either fanaticism or either went off on tantrums or either so cold they just can't be moved. That's all. Amen. Now, do you love one another? Amen. Oh, shake hands with each other and say, praise the Lord. 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 Praise the Lord, sister. God bless you. God bless you. Take the name of Jesus with you as a shield from every snare. For when temptations round you gather, what do you do? Softly. Let's not forget that now. Let's sing that verse again. Take the name of Jesus with you. What for? For a shield from every snare. When Satan tries to snare you. When temptations round you gather. What do you do? Just breathe that holy name. For the Lord is before my face, I shall not be moved. Precious name, precious name, oh, how sweet, oh, 